So to start off the session that we're calling The View from the Lab is a man who's not just designing the future of imaging. He's also going to share his secrets on how to come up with really powerful new ideas. Please welcome from MIT Media Lab, Ramesh Raskar. There are, there are more than three billion people with a camera in their pocket. And this is creating an amazing revolution in imaging and visual computing. My students at uh, MIT Media Lab um, are taking these imaging technologies to create something futuristic, but also for social innovation. In this case, a snap-on eyepiece to perform eye tests on a mobile phone. Or cameras that can visualize the world at one trillion frames per second so that they can look around corners. And glasses-free 3D displays that create a four-dimensional representation of the world so that you can have a hyper-realistic experience. Now, all of us are inventing and pushing the envelopes of technology and art and design and business and policy. But the process of invention often seems very confusing. What I've learned is that I need a mental framework. And I have, I, have, uh, I have used this notion of, if you know X, what is next? So let me share with you a mental framework, which I call Idea Hexagon, that I have used in my classes and also many events uh, worldwide. Now, it's all common sense, but you can come up with dozens of ideas using this Idea Hexagon. All right? So let's get started. If somebody told you a great idea, you can share photos online, what would be your next idea? Yeah, share videos. And Flickr was sold for a few million dollars, and YouTube was sold for $1.6 billion. And all we have done is gone from images to video. So you already know the first strategy, which is generalize the idea to the next dimension. What you can do for data, do it for text, for audio, do it for images, video, and what's that? It's 3D. So here's another pop question. If you know airbags can save lives in a car, where else would you use airbags? Bicycles, aircrafts, you can go micro or you can go macro. So when it comes to dimensions, we have gone from two-dimensional displays to three-dimensional, but we have to wear those funny glasses. And so in my lab, uh, we are building glasses-free 3D displays, but it turns out the appearance of the world is not three-dimensional, but it's four-dimensional. And I'm not talking about time, even for a static scene. So try explaining that to my grandma. The world's appearance is four-dimensional. And the challenge, of course, is that if you want to create this glasses-free experience, we would need roughly one terabyte of data per second. And that's clearly beyond the abilities of today's displays. So what we have to do is do compression, but not in software, but in optics. And so we have created new forms of computational displays that can bring the bandwidth down to a more manageable one gigabyte per second. And these glasses-free 3D displays combine optics and electronics and computation with two or three layers of LCD. Strategy number two, combine X with an idea that you may already know, Y. 
But the more important part here is the more dissimilar X from Y, the more spectacular the fusion. Uh, a few years ago, I went to get uh, a CT scan. Uh, always think there's something wrong with my head. And um, I heard this rattling sound, kind of very scary. So if you go online and look for some videos of what happens inside a, a, a CT scan machines, uh, these are the kind of videos you'll find. Okay. And now just imagine your head is inside this jet engine. Now, this is how ridiculous some of these technologies are, in, ca in this case, CAT scan machines. They really haven't changed fundamentally. They're just making the jet engine go faster and faster. Well, there's a better way to think about it. It turns out in astronomy, also, you have to look at distant stars, and, and features that are really faint. And there's a method called coded aperture imaging. And that allows you, without mechanical motion, to create images of objects for which you cannot use lenses, very much like x-rays in CT machines. So what my group is doing is combining these two ideas, CT machine with ideas from coded aperture and creating new machines that have no mechanical motion no scary sounds, and um, in the future, we can create portable CT machines that will be as simple as headbands or chest bands. Well, you're getting a hang of it. Let's go to the next strategy. If you're given a hammer, an amazing technique, X, find all the nails, not just the problem it was solving to start with, but all the new problems. Uh, I grew up in India in a small town called Nasik, uh, in a family with very modest income, uh, no TV, no fridge, uh, no eating out. Uh, but my father did give me uh, a very cheap a black and white camera, one of those you know, focus-free uh, pinhole cameras, and one roll of film. Um, and developing was very expensive. So uh, to use up that roll of 24 photos, do you know how long it took me? A week, a month, a whole year. Most of the time, I used to just you know, practice how to compose the shot. Um, from that, I think I have come a long way <laughs> in my lab, where we are building cameras that can visualize the world, not a million, or a billion, but one trillion frames per second. We call it a new form of photography, femtophotography, so fast that you can see light in motion. And when you think about something moving fast, you think about bullets. So if you send bullets of light into this ordinary scene, a Coke bottle, how will light enter and move through this bottle. We can watch light in slow motion. The pulse of light, the bullet of light enters, starts, starts scattering on the table. You see ripples like throwing a stone in a pond of water. Majority of light goes and hits the cap. Light starts bouncing around in an air bubble near the top of the cap. Meanwhile, the energy fronts are moving on the table. And because of the concave nature, after several picoseconds, light focuses at the back of the bottle. Now, I have slowed down this video by a factor of 10 billion. Because light takes only about one trillionth one nanosecond to go across the screen. And talking about the bullet, an ordinary bullet, if you let the bullet go 
the same distance about a foot and slow the movie down by a factor of 10 billion. Do you know how long you have to sit here <laughs> to watch that movie? A week, a month, a whole year. Very boring movie. <laughs> so given this amazing hammer of ultra-fast imaging that we have invented uh, in our lab, what can we do with it? We can create new forms of computational photography where we can create time lapse and color coding so that we can visualize the propagation of light. Again, like throwing a stone in a pond of water. We can use these cameras to provide new superhuman abilities, cameras that can look around corners beyond line of sight. For that, we shine light on the visible parts, in this case, the door. Light bounces into the room. Fraction of the light comes back to the door, and even tinier fraction back to the camera. And by analyzing these multiple bounces of light, echoes of light, we can create 3D shapes of what's around a corner. And it's not just science fiction. Uh, we have built uh, this device and demonstrated it <clears throat> using cameras that can see objects by bouncing light off of this door on the right. And the system is still in the lab, but in the future, we might be able to create cars that avoid collision with what's around the band. Or we can look for survivors in hazardous conditions by shining beams into visible parts and analyzing reflected signatures over time. Or we can build endoscopes that can see deep inside the body, well beyond the reach of today's cardioscope or lagrangioscopes and so on. So the strategy number three was given a hammer, find all the nails, and often with the same hammer, you can also start hitting screws and bolts. So here's a quick exercise. We all download software and use app stores. It's an amazing idea. Keeps your device fresh, and you can keep improving it. So how come every device that has some electronics and computing is not creating its own app store? Whether it's your fridge, your microwave, your projector, your camera, they should all have their own app stores and make the system open. Strategy number four is exactly opposite of strategy number three. Given a nail, find all the hammers. Given an amazing technique, an amazing solution, try to find all the other problems it can solve as well. Recently heard about an amazing technology called a light-filled camera um, and productized by Lytro. The idea itself is more than 100 years old by Lipman in 1908, where by capturing the world not in 3D, but in 4D, you can refocus the image in software. So you start with a high resolution image, and you can refocus it in software. Now, the challenge with such digital refocusing is that you lose a lot of resolution. But if you take inspiration from how nature solves this problem. There are creatures that use shadows. There are creatures that use refraction, much like mammals. And then there are creatures that use reflection, mirrors. So a lobster or a scallop actually has no lenses and uses array of tiny mirrors to focus an image on its imager, on its retina. So next time you're enjoying your seafood, <laughs> Think about it. They are looking at you in a very different way. Well, you can take these ideas. Even a worm actually has a shielding pigment. Instead of a, a micro lens array, it has a shielding pigment that allows the worm to navigate and find food. We can take the same idea and create a light filled camera, this 4D camera, simply by placing a shielding pigment, a printed mask on top of a sensor. And for a couple of dollars, in a couple of minutes, you can convert any camera 
into a light field camera. And by capturing this four dimensional information, you'll be able to play with light, play with focus, play with tilt shift, and all these amazing new opportunities. You're really getting a hang of it now, right? The idea hexagon. It's not just for invention and technology, but you can use it in various fields, in design, in art, in business, you know, even to figure out how to plan your summer vacation. So let's look at the next strategy. It's X plus plus. Take an existing idea you just heard and add your favorite adjective. And the most common one you will use are faster, better, cheaper. But there's some other ones that I'm sure you use. You can make it parallelized. You can make it distributed. You can make it more efficient. Or some newer ones. You can make it democratized, personalized, make it green. Wikipedia is encyclopedia democratized. Or Pandora is radio personalized. And so on. You can come with dozens of ideas by just adding an adjective. And the final strategy is to be a rebel, be a teenager, and do exactly opposite of what everybody else is telling you. You know about high jump? You saw here, right here in London 2012. Well, people don't go jump up to the high, high uh, people don't jump, run up to the, high, uh, to, the, to the bar and jump and land on their feet and their legs. Because in the 60s, that's how it was done you would land in a sand pit. But the American colleges changed that to a foam rubber. And Fosbury, in the 60s, realized that he doesn't have to do it the same way. He can actually land on his back without worrying about an injury. Kind of a strange way to do that. And of course, everybody thought he was weird. <clears throat> Long story short, Fosbury went on to win the Olympics gold in 1968. And now everybody does that. If you, in the whole ecosystem of an athlete, one tiny, cha one tiny thing had changed. The sand pit had changed to a foam rubber. And when you're looking at technologies in this room, when you read online, when you watch and listen to great innovators, that one tiny bit is all it takes sometimes to transform the ecosystems, that foam rubber moment. And for me, the foam rubber moment was a realization that the pixel pitch of new displays, the retina displays, is now down to about 25 micrometers. So when they called it a retina display, they probably didn't realize that we'll use it for diagnostics of the eye. Now, how do we do the diagnostics? If you want to get a cataract exam, you use a slit lamp, a device that really hasn't changed since the last 30 years to get a retinal scan. Now this device cost a quarter million dollars, but check out the user interface. The nerd has to show my eye <laughs> so that it's aligned with the eyepiece. And to get prescription for eyeglasses, lost in a foropter. Now these solutions are great in rich countries, but there are millions worldwide who are suffering from conditions that otherwise have simple solutions. So we have come up with a new one. It's called iNetra. It's a snap-on eyepiece that goes on top of a cell phone. You look through it, there'll be some patterns. Use the keyboard of the phone to align the patterns. And when you hit calculate, it gives you data for a prescription of your eyeglasses. Nearsightedness. <laughs> Nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. The eyepiece costs next to nothing. All the intelligence is in the software, um, and the results are comparable to high-end devices. And as a bonus, you can also check for cataracts, which is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness. So in the break, we'll be doing some eye tests. Now, you know that more than half a billion people worldwide need glasses but don't wear them. But they do have cell phones. In fact, there are more toothbrushes, sorry, more cell phones than toothbrushes in the world. 
so we can use it in interesting ways. And when it comes to glasses themselves, the challenge of diagnostics remains, although the delivery of eyeglasses have become extremely easy now, manufacturing uh, and delivery. So the most sophisticated method to get uh, your, your refraction is so-called shark hartmann wavefront sensor, but using our strategy number six, I said let's do exactly opposite of this high-end solution. Instead of shining light into the eye, we're going to create an inverse of a shark hartmann wavefront sensor. We, we're going to use the cell phone and use the interaction to replace the lasers and use the LCD of the screen to replace the expensive sensors. And so just for a few dollars, you can start doing these eye tests. And eye tests are not just about whether we can see the world clearly. You know, children don't go to school and they remain Ill illiterate because they can't see what's on the board. Or elderly cannot perform their job and remain unemployed, and that leads to poverty. So it's a huge socioeconomic problem as well. And sometimes you just want to watch Ronaldinho kick that soccer goal on TV in high definition. So it plays a really important role uh, in many ways. So we, we have received a great response for Netra and iNetra worldwide. And we have worked with our collaborators uh, internationally. Uh, we have done a lot of field trials uh, and talked to people on the street, people who sell optical glasses uh, in high-end chains, to low-end chains, um, talk to NGOs, talk to hospitals and clinics, and realizing that the, the social scientists, the creative folks, the engineers, the doctors can really work together to solve this problem. So we have spun out a venture called inethra.com to take glasses to the masses. And when we saw this woman outside Hyderabad, who's inventing a business by using the technology called a weighing scale. And check out the entrance to her business. She's very proud. <laughs> and it makes you realize that these entrepreneurs can take new technologies at a mass scale in unimaginable ways. Now, Every one of us has an innate ability to invent and solve problems. And with the right framework, every one of us can take emerging technologies and social innovation to the next level. Thank you. <laughs>